Good day. Copy the heading down and then we'll do some hard yakka. As usual, we will start by testing your knowledge. So put down the numbers 1 to 6 on the left hand side of your page. Question 1. Write the symbols for the four main gases in the atmosphere. Question 2. Isotopes of elements have different numbers of what? Question 3. Each element has its own special number of what? Question 4. Which two non-metals can cause a river to experience eutrophication? Question 5. What vital substance in water will drop at night in a stream experiencing eutrophication? Question 6. What is the hardest allotrope or crystal form of the nonmetal carbon?
Group 6 in the periodic table includes the nonmetals oxygen, sulfur, and selenium, as well as the semi-metals tellurium and polonium. Polonium is a heavy metal and is radioactive. It was first discovered by Marie and Pierre Curie. The elements of group 6 have a maximum valence or oxidation state of plus 6, but their most common valence is minus 2. When combined with metals, they are written second in the formula. So write down the first heading for the reactive nonmetal oxygen. Oxygen is overwhelmingly the dominant non-metal on planet Earth. For the whole Earth, it is the second most abundant element after iron. Its nearest relative, sulphur, which also has six electrons in its outer shell, is only one-tenth as abundant. The Earth is layered with a low-density oxygen dominating the crust of the Earth at 47%. Sulphur is more common in the Earth's core, which is mostly iron and nickel. Sulphur chemicals tend to escape the inside of the Earth from volcanic vents and smokers on the Earth's sea floor. Our sense of smell quickly identifies these poisons. Oxygen also dominates the Earth's atmosphere at 21% of dry air. It is dense enough not to boil off easily from the top of the atmosphere, as hydrogen and helium do. It also combines with any hydrogen, forming water vapour, which can make up 4% of the air near sea level. Copy and complete. The top three most reactive nonmetals on the planet are oxygen at the top of group 6 and fluorine and chlorine at the top of group 7. Because oxygen is the most abundant of the three and present in elemental form in the atmosphere, it tends to dominate chemical reactions on the surface of the planet. Oxygen can form oxide compounds with most elements, with the possible exception of the group 8 inert gases. Geologists are certainly aware of this. They learn to analyse rocks in terms of the percentages of the various oxide compounds that they contain. Dark igneous rocks, such as gabbro, contain more iron and magnesium oxides. Light-coloured igneous rocks, such as granite, contain more silicon and aluminium oxides. Coastal developers, miners, governments and the public 
should be made aware of the reactivity of shales, coal seams, metal sulphide ore deposits and waterlogged coastal soils with atmospheric oxygen. Grey shales and floodplain soils contain pyrite which is iron sulphide. It can also contain arsenic impurities. Expose them to the air and water by digging trenches to drain them causes the pyrite to react with the oxygen and water forming sulfuric acid. Most mines will leak sulfuric acid into the local creeks. You can test for acid sulphate soils by adding hydrogen peroxide to them. The soils will bubble dangerous rotten egg gas. Another indicator for these soils is the presence of casuarina vegetation. Do not drain or build on these soils. The sulfuric acid will kill most life in the local waterway. Contaminants such as arsenic and aluminium will poison the soils and colourful iron hydroxide will stain the area. To fix the problem, fill in the drains and put the water back onto the floodplain. The Asians learned long ago that these areas are only suitable for wetland crops such as rice growing. Well, if the toughest rock minerals will combine with this reactive oxygen stuff, how can we humans possibly cope? The truth is that humans evolved in an oxygen-rich environment and we use it to survive. A scientist could crudely define a person as a big bag of some trillions of body cells floating in salty water and trying to cooperate with each other. These cells come in all shapes and sizes. Here are just a couple. The flavour of the month is stem cells and you might like to research them. People are dynamic, meaning our bodies are constantly changing, moving and doing things. To do this, we make energy chemically. The cells are provided with energy foods, which we react with oxygen to make energy. It all happens in special parts of our cells called mitochondria. The foods that we burn in the mitochondria include glucose sugars, fatty acids and sometimes amino acids. The oxygen is brought from the lungs using red blood cells. Living cells need a constant supply of oxygen and we are all hot stuff as a consequence. <laughs> Copy and complete. Oxygen has two allotropes which are both bluish liquids at very low temperatures. Normal oxygen has two atoms per molecule and is a gas above minus 183 degrees Celsius. The more reactive oxygen allotrope, ozone, has three oxygen atoms per molecule and is a gas above minus 112 degrees Celsius. 
Ozone is poisonous and damaging to humans. We will deal with normal oxygen first. It is made on an industrial scale by cooling air until the oxygen forms a liquid and the remaining nitrogen gas is separated. It is stored in gas cylinders and finds uses in oxyacetylene welding gear and as emergency oxygen in hospitals. It is not easy to use. Too much can actually damage your eyes and lungs. Fighter pilots, astronauts and divers sometimes push the oxygen danger limits and need to follow strict training and protocols. Liquid oxygen is used with various fuels such as liquid hydrogen in rockets. This is the biggest such rocket ever used. The mighty Saturn V rocket used to hurl the tiny lunar capsules on their journey to the moon. The missions were very dangerous. In the laboratory we can make oxygen by reacting oxygen rich hydrogen peroxide with a catalyst manganese dioxide. If you do this wear goggles. Test for oxygen by holding a glowing splint in the gas. It will rekindle. In a gas jar you might like to try freshly lit steel wool using tongs or a deflagrating spoon. Again wear goggles. All sorts of things will burn in oxygen and there are many safety issues, some needing welding ultraviolet goggles to protect the eyes and others needing fume cupboards because of the poisonous gases and possible explosions involved. A number of chemicals react similarly to oxygen with fuels. They bear these symbols for oxidising agents and should never ever be stored near fuels. Be warned, these things can kill or burn people. <coughs> Copy and complete. Ozone is a far more reactive and unstable form of oxygen that is found at very low concentrations in the Earth's atmosphere. Human noses don't like it and can smell it in concentrations of one part per hundred million in air. You have probably noticed it after violent lightning storms and near electrical equipment that is sparking or in rooms containing laser printers or duplicators. It is an asthma trigger and has been linked to heart attacks and bronchitis. Sydney is badly polluted by ozone, particularly in the south and west and near highways. This diagram shows that ozone is concentrated in two parts of the atmospheric column. The top layer is the famous ozone layer and occurs in the stratosphere where pressurised jet aircraft fly at heights between 16 and 35 kilometres. It contains 90% of the Earth's ozone. This particular ozone layer 
is caused by the bombardment of normal oxygen by nasty high-frequency radiations from the sun. The ozone layer is good for life on the planet because it absorbs the nastier higher frequency ultraviolet radiations turning the ultraviolet energy to heat. Enough lower frequency ultraviolet gets through to allow our skins to make vital vitamin D. Since we learn to make CFC and halon chemicals for use in refrigerators and air conditioners, much of the upper ozone layer is depleted, particularly over Antarctic and southern Australia in spring. These molecules react with ozone, turning it to normal oxygen, and are increasing Australia's rate of sunburn and skin cancers. We humans are bottom dwellers in a thin ocean of air, so the lower tropospheric ozone layer is of interest to us. That's the stuff we are breathing. Ozone is indirectly formed by lightning. Oxides of nitrogen form first by the high temperature combination of nitrogen and oxygen gases in the air. The reactive nitrogen oxides then react with oxygen to make the ozone that we smell in thunderstorms. We humans are breeding out of control. There are more people alive today than ever lived in the past. London and ancient Rome used to contain 50,000 souls. Now we have megacities full of cars, electric arc furnaces and electrical machines. So ozone is increasing as well as all the other nasty gases that react together to make photochemical smog. Nitrogen dioxide stains a smog brown and smog reduces our life expectancy. These are some pictures of smoggy cities. I won't name the cities or they may get upset. It is said that the English King Edward I banned cold fires to reduce smog in London in 1306. The Chinese government closed factories and banned car use to reduce smog for the Beijing Olympics. There are technologies that we can use to reduce the smog problem. We just seem to lack the will and organisation to use them. Like most dangerous chemicals, there are some uses for ozone. It can be used to treat cyanide waste in gold mines and to remove some contaminants in drinking water. It is used as an alternative to chlorine in paper making plants and for chlorine in swimming pools. Just try to avoid breathing the ozone. Copy and complete.
put a heading for our second non-metal, sulphur. The second element in group 6 forms a yellow solid at room temperature and burns with a pale blue flame forming the acrid choking gas sulphur dioxide. The ancients knew sulphur well as the rock which burns. The Chinese had access to pure forms of sulphur and used it as one ingredient in gunpowder. Sulphur often coats the rocks around active volcanoes. Here sulphur burns at night in the massive crater of the Hawaiian volcano Kilauea. Closer to home are the hot spring sulphur deposits of Rotorua and White Island in the North Island of New Zealand. The land of the Long White Cloud has experienced the frightening eruption of supervolcanoes in its past and may do so again. In Australia the absence of modern volcanoes is both a blessing and a curse as our soils lack the fertility that young volcanoes bring. We Aussies either import our sulphur or create it as a byproduct of processing our valuable metal sulphide ores such as galena, chalcopyrite, or Sulphur is an element of life and is present in two of the amino acids that we humans use to make living protein. For this reason, a number of artificial plant fertilizers such as superphosphate, potassium sulphate, and ammonium sulphate contain sulphur. I use powdered sulphur as a safe fungicide to treat plant leaves infected by powdery mildew. Some foods such as garlic contain a fair amount of sulphur. Garlic is a useful part of our diet. A number of sulphur compounds are poisonous and the human body is warned of their presence using its chemical sense of smell. The worst of these chemicals is hydrogen sulphide or rotten egg gas, which is quite capable of killing people. In my early days of chemistry, every laboratory had a Kipps hydrogen sulphide generator sitting in the fume cupboard. We used the gas to analyse for metal ions and the labs used to stink. Human noses can detect hydrogen sulphide in concentrations as low as 0.005 parts per million. Unfortunately, the smell disappears at around 150 parts per million, and at levels above this, a few minutes exposure can kill. People working in sewer lines need monitoring equipment and oxygen gear. Bacteria living in oxygen-poor swampy ground or near gas vents on the ocean floor convert sulphates to hydrogen sulphide. You can smell hydrogen sulphide in natural mineral waters, freshly dug up roads, petroleum and natural gas, and in volcanoes and volcanic geysers. Copy and complete.
hydrogen sulfide may be a deadly poison, but it burns and oxidizes readily when exposed to the air. So it is not the widespread atmospheric sulfur pollutant. That honour belongs to sulfur dioxide gas. Whilst not as poisonous as its cousin compound, sulfur dioxide is a major lung irritant and asthma trigger. A lot of people react violently to its presence. Northern Hemisphere coals and oils contain much more sulphur than the Australian ones. Their oils are usually described as heavy, sour crudes, and our oil refineries need to do a lot of processing to deal with them. Australian crudes contain more petrol and gases, and are described as light, sweet crudes, low in sulphur. Little wonder that big international companies spend big money mining and exporting our fossil fuels. So what is the big deal about sulphur in fuels? In London, the sulphur dioxide from burning coal produced pea super poisonous smogs. On one horror night in 1952, London experienced temperature inversion conditions similar to the air over Sydney. The smog was trapped and concentrated by a layer of denser air on top, as shown in this Sydney picture. 4,000 people died that night of bronchitis and pneumonia, with 8,000 more soon after. Another 100,000 people took ill. The British public became enraged, and the usual government committees of inquiry realised that they actually had to do something. So they finally unchained the scientists and empowered them to make decisions. Power stations and industry were made to introduce technologies to remove sulphur from their emissions, and the household burning of coal was banned. Most British coal mines were eventually closed and alternative power sources introduced. The Europeans were happy. British and European smogs were turning the lakes of Europe acid. Even the forests were dying from the fallout of sulfurous and sulfuric acid rains. Much of Europe switched to nuclear reactors, wind farms and gas generators. They invented technologies for dealing with the gas and solid particles emitted by smokestacks. The smoke can be washed to remove the fine particles that clog our lungs and dissolve gases such as sulphur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, hydrochloric acid and ammonia. Acids can be neutralised using a variety of alkalis. The sulphur chemicals alone that are collected can be used to make fertilisers, detergents and sulphuric acid. Well, what about Australia? These figures from the Department of the Environment show our major pollutant chemicals in tonnes per annum. In cars we have catalytic converters for dealing with carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide emissions. Homing in on sulphur dioxide, we see that the major emitters are coal-fired power stations and metal sulphide smelters. If you live near them, you have worries. Many of these facilities are old and the companies that run them have a lot of debt. 
the technology exists to do better. Our oil refineries are beginning to reduce sulphur in our fuels. But the benzene chemicals in modern fuels, as well as diesel smoke, are causing cancers in people. Our road tunnels urgently need anti-pollution technology. On an individual level, you can brick up the wood fire. Your neighbours will thank you for that. They won't have to breathe the acid smoke. Never burn copper's logs, which emit poisonous arsenic smoke. Use them in the barbecue and you'll end up with arsenic sausages. Copy and complete. There have been a number of extinction events in our geologic past. One of the worst occurred at the end of the Permian period whilst these rocks formed south of Sydney. Sulphur chemicals may or may not have played a role. Our sister planet Venus has a dense atmosphere of carbon dioxide and clouds of sulphuric acid. Jupiter's closest moon, Io, has a surface coated in sulphur chemicals and active sulphur volcanoes. We should at least be intrigued. That is the stuff of science. <laughs>